So okay. Good. Thank you. You're still trying to post in a chat? Yeah, I'm just trying to send this to I'm having trouble, but I'm almost there. I don't know why it's uh, but now it's working. No, just a mosquito there. Not good. All right. And um, you sent me the new bios. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to have to refresh and get it. I always... So while Connie's working on that, everyone, I'll just get started. Um, we're just trying to get Koi and Ginger's bio posted in the chat. Connie, actually, are you ready? Because you're going to do the main intro. I am going to do the main intro. Okay. Well, you said you wanted um, to introduce the series. Oh, oh, you know, I, I just meant that I was going to put it into the chat. So that's what I sent to Randy and Peter just now. Uh, but I can certainly, um, okay. I can certainly no introduce the series. It's okay. Yeah. So, um, um, everything is slow because we're on, um, we're on zoom and, uh, outlook is a little slow, but welcome everyone. I can, I can certainly welcome everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I don't know if Connie just froze, but everyone, thanks for coming to the series. Tonight is the fourth series in our information sessions on ways to create affordable housing in Chevy Chase. As you know, we are starting um, on the SAP process, small area plan. And one of the things that the ANC wanted to bring to the community Chevy Chase small area plan. So, um, to that right. is an information series that kind of gives everyone different ways to look at how to produce okay. affordable housing in our community. So tonight's series, Connie, you froze. <laughs> tonight's series That's is fine. about community land trust. And we have with us today two great presenters that have a lot of experience in this area, Coy McKinney and Ginger Rump. And I'm gonna give them an opportunity to introduce themselves. I wanna first give um, Connie an opportunity because she did freeze at the beginning of the presentation to just kind of say, Connie, if you wanna add anything in there, I don't know if you heard what I heard, but if you wanna add any information in about the overall theme of the information series, and this one here, particular tonight, Community Land Trust. Okay, I hope I'm not freezing. Am I still freezing? No, you're okay. This is not good. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, thank you so much. I just would like to add that this information series, this information exchange series, rather, um, started from a resolution that the uh, commission put together to try to actively involve the community in certain topics of interest. And so prior sessions, um, the topics were just in general, what's a small area plan for the Chevy Chase small area planning process that we're in now? Um, what's, what are the things that we should be looking for? And that expert was Jeff Farner from the city of Alexandria and Commissioner Gosselin was the host and the moderator there. The last two, I hosted a moderator. One was on um, who are the apartment dwellers here? And uh, what do they think about our area and what ideas do they have? And uh, last week, uh, it was um, about how to, we can creatively use space uh, to leverage underutilized space uh, to support entrepreneurs and creatives, as well as to make sure that we can promote economic vitality. And that was a very, very good talk. So tonight, we're really um, very happy to welcome to new speakers on a topic that we all care about. And I'm gonna throw it right back over to Commissioner Gore and we'll make sure that we get their bios uh, in the chat. Yes. So while we're doing that, I would like, Koi, can you um, start off by telling us a little bit about yourself and your background, how you got involved in the whole community land trust issue? Um, anything you want the audience to know? For sure. Uh, yeah, so my name is Coy McKinney. Uh, I've lived in D.C. since uh, 2009. I initially came here to go to law school. I thought I wanted to be a lawyer. Mm -hmm. uh, I attended UDC's law school. And uh, after the first semester, I was like, mm, that didn't feel as great as I thought it was. Uh, and I <laughs> got more interested in urban agriculture. I ended up graduating from the law school because it was still um, uh, essential learning for me. Uh, and just the legal process and everything. But after graduating, I uh, tried to pursue the urban ag um, 
path and popped around, did a few different projects. And now I'm a teacher. I've been a teacher uh, at a charter school, uh, teaching urban ag to high school students. Um, so it's, it's pretty interesting how I ended up there. But yeah, so I live in Southwest. I've lived in Southwest since 2010. Uh, we've had a lot of development. And, uh, you know, I've noticed a lot of uh, apartments popping up expensive luxury apartments and I've seen the demographics and the culture change in my neighborhood just like in real time since I've been there. Uh, so I got curious about the whole housing model and, and thinking that there's got to be another way that we can build affordable housing that's not, you know, what I term trickle down housing where you build a bunch of expensive units and then sometime hopefully they become affordable at, you know, some unspecified time in the future. Uh, and so while I was at UDC's law school, uh, I actually had a flyer about community land trust. And then in a conversation with uh, a neighbor, he mentioned community land trust as an alternative. Uh, and I was like, ah, oh, that's it. And so uh, I've been doing my research on them ever since. Uh, I recently joined the board of Douglas CLT. That was actually in December. So I guess that wasn't that recently, but um, and yeah, so I'm still learning about the process, but you know, I, I'm just trying to advocate uh, for the city to uh, use this model because I think it's a model that uh, that works. Um, so yeah. Thank you. And Ginger, can you tell us a little bit about your background and how you got involved in the community land trust movement? Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, first of all, thank you so much. This is fantastic, and I'm so sorry that I missed the other series. Uh, I'm gonna have to go find them. So um, this is it's it's wonderful to that y'all are are delving into these topics. Um, I've spent my career in community development, affordable housing, economic development, small business, um, kind of community organizing, sustainability, kind of that gamut, and they they really all do come together. Um, really, it it doesn't make sense to to piecemeal things because um, what we really are talking about is healthy communities, um, connected communities, resilient community, right? And so so many other um, isms that we can throw on the back of, of the phrases. And I am heartened by the fact that there is renewed conversation now around equity and not using equity as just a buzzword, but actually trying to peel back what that means. And in DC, that's one of the reasons that I was uh, very much drawn to the Douglas Community Land Trust or the CLT in its infancy, even before it was named, um, is, is that that notion of, um, it, it really centers racial and economic equity specifically and tries to draw in those different facets of what it really means to have positive, healthy community. Um, and I know we're going to get into more of that um, as we as we go through. Awesome. Thank you. OK, so Koi and Ginger, I'm going to turn it over to you. They have a presentation they're going to start off with. And once they are done with their presentation, we'll have question and answer sessions. All right, just confirming that everyone can see my screen. Awesome, cool. Um, all right, so I know this is a webinar, so it's not as uh, interactive and I've hidden the chat. So this is a quote uh, from Chocolate City. Uh, and I like to pose this to ask people when they think this quote, what time period do you think is described by this quote? Um, normally, when I first read it, I thought it was talking about now, but it's actually talking about the 1930s. So this housing issue is not something new to DC. It's something that's been going on for decades. Uh, and now we're just in the latest cycle of this. And so uh, I think there's a way that we need to uh, I think we need to take a different approach to how we treat housing. Uh, the pandemic showed that if healthcare should be a right, uh, well then it's, it's hard to quarantine when you don't have a house. So then housing should also be a right. Housing is healthcare. And so how do we keep people in homes and how do we address this affordable housing crisis in a way that's 
uh, not only works, but is rooted in equity, racial equity in particular. Uh, so yes, uh, I want to give uh, a little uh, word of caution to you ANCs, uh, because uh, you mentioned that you're in the small area plan uh, phase. Uh, Southwest went through that a couple years ago, and uh, our, our small area plan had some great quotes in there that we thought we felt really good about, um, yet they, how development happened in our neighborhood, it doesn't, in my opinion, it doesn't match to some of the quotes that were in the Southwest neighborhood neighborhood plan, which was supposed to be, uh, which was supposed to be a guiding document for development. So it's not to say that, you know, don't do it, do it, but just be prepared to fight for what the, uh, the, um, what you get into it. Uh, so for example, one quote that I've been using over and over in, in my conversations with the zoning commission and with ANCs and with uh, council members is that the Southwest neighborhood plan said that Southwest will remain an exemplary model of equity and inclusion. Exemplary, meaning that it would be an example to other uh, communities, neighborhoods, cities, yet uh, that hasn't happened. Um, the median income has increased 117%. The median home price has increased 55%. Uh, the black population has gone down nearly 40 percentage points. So this is not what residents wanted. We, we haven't seen uh, what we wanted the neighborhood to develop. We, we weren't, you know, the residents weren't against development, but they just wanted it to be equitable development. And we haven't seen that. So uh, we're, we're, again, this, is, this emphasizes the need to look for a different approach. Um, and so, you know, uh, the, the, the mayor's housing equity report, which was, which was uh, released in 2019, said that most housing production was geared towards people at 120% of the MFI, median family income, which is over $100,000. Uh, that's people making over $100,000 a year. And those are the people that do not, yes, they need housing, but that's not Justice. Justice to me is those who have been historically and intentionally underserved. Their interests, their needs should be going, uh, should be put front and center. And building uh, housing for people at 120% of the MFI, that's not justice. So we need a, we did, again, we need a different approach. And so that's where community land trusts uh, come in. Uh, they're an effective approach that uh, have a history that's rooted in racial justice. So actually the first community land trust uh, was used in 1969 by uh, in the civil rights movement by uh, black activists who were trying to prevent black farmers from being displaced from their land. So uh, black displacement from land is the reason for the community land trust. And we've seen that in DC just a few years ago, it got uh, that, label as being the most intensely gentrified city in America. And of course, uh, if we look at it racially, most of the people that have been displaced have been black Washingtonians. So community land trusts, they have a history in racial justice. Now, just because uh, they're just a tool, it's still up to people to implement and make sure that the tool is used effectively. Um, and so one example is Proud Ground, which is a community land trust that's outside of Portland, where they're aiming for 75% of the new homeowners to be black or brown, okay? So that's, you know, C different CLTs can have different missions, but I would hope that um, justice would be central in all CLTs because it's a great model. Uh, and this, this uh, fact from a 2018 Grounded Solution study uh, emphasizes that, is that, and it found that it looked at four, over 4,000 units in 20 different states over 30 years and found that 99% of those units that are in a shared equity model, which is either a community land trust or a limited equity cooperative, which is also worth exploring limited equity co-ops. Um, definitely add that to your list as well. So this, this study found that 99% of those units avoided for foreclosure. So all the dips and turns and cycles and booms and crash and all that stuff that's happened over the last 30 years, people stayed in their homes. 99% of those people stayed in their homes. So this is clearly a model uh, that can work. And so um, I'm part of a, an effort in Southwest to expand the Douglas Community Land Trust into our neighborhood. 
so we have a fire truck repair station um, that is going to get relocated. It's going to relocate to um, Blue Plains. Um, and uh, in my conversations uh, with Council Member Charles Allen, he said that he thinks that this is going to happen in about three to four years. And the comprehensive plan, the newly passed comprehensive plan, actually shows uh, that the zoning for the parcel of land has changed. So we see that this is what it was before, this is what it is now. And so now residential and commercial development uh, can be uh, permitted there. And with the wharf, which is one of the biggest examples that we've seen of public land going to a private developer, that was leased to Hoffman for a dollar, a 99 year lease for $1. And in return, we've gotten a whole bunch of expensive apartments, condos, restaurants uh, that really haven't catered to, you know, uh, the people who need, you know, services down here. And, you know, my personal gripe is that there used to be a restaurant in Southwest called Jenny's. It had been in the neighborhood for 40 years. In phase one of the wharf, there was over 100,000 uh, square feet of retail space but they couldn't find space for Jenny's, a restaurant that had been in the neighborhood for 40 years. To me, like, and you know, the where it hits home for me is that they had the best General Tso's chicken I've ever had. And so every time I get a craving uh, for General Tso's chicken, I think, you know, I just shake my fist in the sky as, as like an old man. But you know, that that shows that if the community had had a say in the redevelopment of the wharf, I'm I'm sure Jenny's would be there. Um, so anyway, so we have this opportunity now to go a different path. And so we're saying, let's expand the Douglas Community Land Trust into this parcel of land. Um, let's have permanently affordable housing. Let's have permanently affordable retail space. Let's uh, create um, a Southwest chapter uh, that can steward the land, that can take the interest of, of public housing residents in the neighborhood and, and create something that caters to their needs. And in the recent budget, they had 37 million set aside for infrastructure at McMillian, 20 million for the Crumble School redevelopment, and 11.1 million for uh, Hill East. So there's money that can be spent uh, for this for this to happen. And so we're in the process in Southwest of uh, getting the 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 idea of the model out to uh, people that live there, getting input from public housing residents because we want them to be uh, front and center in this, in any design that comes up. Um, and so we're in the early stages of that, but this is just an opportunity that we think is too too good to um, pass up on. So now for the, the details and how actual community land trust works, I'm gonna pass this over to Ginger to get into all that nitty gritty good stuff. All right, thanks, Koi. Um, yeah, and Koi, Koi is, uh, he's got this, backwards and forwards. And so um, I'm going to go through this rather quickly, because uh, I know we also want to get to, to uh, we want to spend the bulk of time answering questions and seeing what you guys are really excited about. But uh, community land trust, um, right. So generally speaking, uh, your classic CLT model is a nonprofit organization with members. Now there's different variations on this. There are CLTs that skew more toward um, having professional experts and having municipal uh, folks on the board. Douglas Community Land Trust, which we'll get into later, um, chose the path of the classic community land trust that harkens back to uh, civil rights era um, that really put power and decision-making in the hands of the people, the members then elect the board. And you can see here, typically, again, that if they have a tripartite structure, which means that at least one third of the board are folks who live in CLT and one third are uh, general members. And then you've got one third who are your professional or technical experts, but those overlap. Um, of course, you get technical experts that are living in CLT units, for instance. Um, so just keep it on, flip in there, Koi. <laughs> um, and CLTs can be utilized, we're, we're focused a bit on housing, but CLTs are used for uh, any number of uses, residential, commercial, farming, um, environmental uses. Um, but, the, but the real crux of how a CLT works is 
And we're going to see a variety of slides on this, and we can talk through this a little bit more. But generally speaking, you, you separate out ownership of the land from ownership of the building. Hey, this is what commercial leases do all the time. Uh, and in fact, this is what district government does oftentimes when it is disposing of district owned land. They don't sell it outright, but um, that tend to, or oftentimes will provide a lease for the use of that land on top. So CLTs do this in order to not be restrictive. Um, however, uh, it, it's kind of the opposite of when we think about redlining, right? So redlining was about keeping people out certain people. This particular type of covenant is about ensuring that a certain people, specifically people who have been underserved and who otherwise wouldn't be able to stay, are ensured being able to stay. Um, and so you separate out ownership of the land from the building. The landowner, the CLT, issues a lease to the owner. And it stipulates that you have to maintain affordability at a particular level, whatever level was negotiated. Um, and sometimes it also includes use restrictions as well. So for instance, in the, in the example of a commercial or retail space, you might say, we, all, we not only want this to be affordable, but we want this particular property to be available for use by a local, CBEs, uh, but just a, just a, and then there's an example here about a resident, you know, if you purchase your home, purchase your home outright, the CLT owns the land underneath it, issues a lease back, the land, the uh, homeowner pays a very small fee, CLT fee, and partially that is so that the CLT is aware of how things are going with the mortgage payments. Um, if you're, if the owner's late, then the CLT also gets notified because oftentimes it'll be hooked into the escrow. Now we're talking about a, this is specifically a single family home ownership situation. Um, when the owner goes to sell, they get to pay it forward. They get to take uh, equity that they have gained through paying down their mortgage and, uh, and a portion of the resale value. But another portion of the resale value simply stays with the home for use for benefiting the next generation of owner. And Koi, you want to talk a bit about the uh, just a quick blurb on here, the uh, the study from Champlain. Yes, and so um, although I, you know, my personal preference is if if we could have CLTs everywhere, that'd be awesome. Um, but you know, we understand that there is market rate home ownership. And so the CLT for people that uh, don't want to live in the CLT, if they have to, if they have to move and they have to buy a market rate home, because they've been able to save money, they're able to actually transfer from a CLT to a market, they're able to purchase a market rate home. And so this is a uh, example from Champlain, which is uh, I believe they still have the largest CLT in uh, the country, and this is in Vermont, um, how 67% of the people that were that participated in the CLT program were able to buy a market rate home. So um, yes, with the CLT, it's not about, you know, flipping houses and making a profit, but if you can't, you know, it's, it's about staying in your home, but if you do have to move elsewhere and you do have to move to a, a home that's not part of a CLT program, um, hopefully you're able to save enough money that that's also a possibility. Yeah. Yeah, and just um, CLTs in general prioritize the use value as opposed to seeing a home as a commodity that can be traded. But to Koi's point, it doesn't discount what, what folks like to say, harnessing the power of, the, of capital, harnessing the power of the, of the market to help individual households that have typically been left behind get a foothold um, and be able to do better. And we can, do you wanna scroll forward here? Yeah, this is just a, a nice image of showing that, that lease that sits in between the owner 
of the land and the owner of the building on top and the different types of uses that can be um, can be secured. You can secure affordability for all these different types of uses and more. And we can, you wanna talk through this one, Koi? Uh, sure, yeah, so this is just um, um, a slide that's, that's showing that CLTs are a prudent financial choice. So uh, most of the time CLTs get their start from uh, government subsidies. Um, and we know that Chairman Mendelssohn, um, if he uh, gets reelected, he's, he's all about uh, not wasting money. And so if he, if he really cares about a, a affordable housing, he'll get more out of his more out of the investment if he invests in CLT. So for example, this is an example that's rooted in actual data that's relevant to DC. So if we have a home that's valued at over $500,000 to make it affordable to someone at 50% AMI, which is right around the AMI of, uh, of black uh, families in DC, it, will, it would require an initial subsidy of about $400,000. Okay, now if you let that house accrue on the market after seven years, it's going, the, the cost of the house is going to increase to over $630,000. Okay, so then you need a subsidy of over $450,000 to make it still affordable to someone at 50% AMI. After 14 years, the, the price of the house is gonna increase again uh, to over $700,000. And so now you're gonna need a subsidy of over $520,000 to make it affordable. And after 23 years, it's almost at a million dollars and you're gonna need almost $700,000 to make it uh, affordable to someone at 50% AMI. With the CLT model though, uh, that one-time investment of 400,000, of nearly $400,000, that stays good even after 28 years. So you don't need additional funding from the government to make it affordable. It stays affordable because of that covenant, that deed restriction that's in, uh, that prevents the, uh, the, the homeowners from reselling it at market rate uh, prices. So this is just, again, you know, uh, if, we can, if we can do the political organizing to get DC government or the federal government or, you know, uh, I can't remember her name, but Jeff Bezos' ex-wife, if, she, if she's willing to go in on, you know, really making housing affordable, so we'll get a lot of affordable housing uh, using the CLT model. Yeah, and I just, uh, just to point out that the, that, that scenario that Koi just walked through was utilizing actual historical. So we looked at, uh, we did trend analysis over the past actually 20 years in DC to look at how incomes fared against uh, real estate. Um, and so, you know, it's a model, but it's one that we felt is grounded in, in the historical data. And so jumping in, I, I, we're gonna I see there's a question about how do you, where, where do you get the capital to buy the land? Um, and CLTs, there's a variety of different ways to do that. Um, but I would, I'm just gonna answer top line is it's subsidy. So this isn't about, um, this isn't, you can utilize debt and other investment capital to create a, a really healthy capital stack on a project. But at the end of the day, <laughs> anytime you're trying to make something affordable in a very hot real estate market, it is, it is subsidy that is required. And therefore um, you are gonna require uh, philanth uh, philanthropy and you are gonna require government support to be able to secure properties. And over time, what you can do because there's uh, there as you as you grow, you can create an economy and you're you're trading. Not to get too much, uh, we can, we can go into this as much as folks want to want to, but you do start to build a little bit. Your the idea is that you're you're building to reinvest, right? Nonprofits are all about reinvesting back into the community. So Douglas Community Land Trust, as you saw on that slide, 
and we're so thankful that Koi joined the board. Um, we started out, uh, this, this started out, came out of the uh, 11th Street Bridge Park, as uh, many folks may be aware, because folks were thinking about, um, as part of hundreds of meetings around putting together an equitable development plan. What happens when you bring something that large? Uh, are there negative impacts? Um, what can be done? What can you do? What can you put in place in order to assuage or mitigate some of the uh, negative effects, even if the project itself is intending to be positive? And so just like step back, like, uh, and so we're very appreciative of the work that was done. You're looking at a, a, most of the folks on this screen, there's 16 reps right now on the board of directors. Most of them were on the community advisory that started this whole process back in 2017, taking this idea of, hey, how can we prevent displacement to making it an actual, an actual nonprofit? And it's just been an incredible journey. I actually joined several years after they had already done work. Um, joining them at the, uh, in the fall of 2018, we put, we did a lot of work on governance, put, put in our 501c3 in incorporated in 2019 and got our, our actual tax exemption in 2020. So relatively new organization. Uh, and if you flip, and, and by the way, before we flip, you'll see this is the tripartite board. So uh, we, we went ahead, even though we didn't have CLT lessees, we wanted to mirror the board as the way that it would be going forward. However, the last two people you see on the lessee representatives are now people that we actually do have 219 units. Um, and those, those two are folks who live in one of, the, uh, one of the CLT properties. And as we gain more properties, the lessee, they, the lessee representatives will actually be folks who live in the properties. Um, and there are uh, two of the public representatives, it used to be five of the public representatives lived east of the river which is where this started, but we are a Douglas Commonwealth wide organization. And we need to be Douglas Commonwealth wide because the need is so great. And it really makes a lot of sense to have a large organization because you wanna be able to charge very little. Scale is really important from financial sustainability and from a membership perspective. Um, members, elect the board of directors. We, are, we, are, we welcome people to join who share the mission and values of the Douglas Community Land Trust and be as active as you want. But the one thing, one thing that you absolutely have to do is vote. Um, come to the, the annual meeting, vote. And um, we ask the members to make fundamental corporate decisions. Going back to Koi's point about, um, it's about involvement. So let's, keep on flipping to the next slide here. Um, Koi, I stole this from another presentation just because I think it's so apt. I just love uh, some, some folks with whom we, we were talking very early on landed on this. Uh, they, they actually described back to us, oh, what you're talking about is, is like a pay it forward kind of model. And so we took it and ran with it. Yes, that's absolutely true. In, instead of one family or one individual, uh, one entity gaining all of the appreciation, you share it, you, you get the benefit and you share it with the next generation. And that's it. Um, and, and it really has to do with uh, letting folks who otherwise would not be able to stay in DC be able to have a chance to do so and, and not kick a problem down the road. Our, our, our market is, it's not gonna get any easier trying to find properties. We've got to be able to secure what is, if we make things affordable, let's secure them as affordable. And we can, yeah, keep, keep flipping. Um, I'm not gonna to spend too much time on this if folks have questions, uh, but one of the key considerations here, it's not just about acquiring property, but it is what you do after you acquire it. CLTs in general, and certainly Douglas CLT is no exception, we, we are with you. So if you come into the CLT, 
Um, we will be continuing to work with the residents. We want to secure the asset, the, the actual physical property. So we're working with the owner, but also with the resident. So whether you're a homeowner or a renter, whether you are, um, we work with tenant associations and boards of directors of condos and limited equity housing co-ops. Um, that, that's, we are there. We're in fact, and, and we do a lot of trainings for folks. We're having one on Tuesday night, by the way. So if you ever if you go to our website, I think it's, I think it's being updated right now, but uh, we can flip, keep flipping forward. Coy, did you want to take the, uh, just quick, where we, where we stand? I think you probably know this more than I do or better than I do, but I do want to highlight that recently uh, the Douglas CLT was selected uh, in partnership with uh, Habitat for Humanity for the Langston Slater site, which was big news because it's the first time the DC government has uh, chosen a project uh, with the Douglas CLT. Um, and that's, you know, uh, hopefully uh, a sign of things to come. Uh, and also uh, in the most recent budget, um, there's $2 million set aside for the Douglas CLT. Of course, I would have wanted more, but uh, we got to start somewhere. And so um, I do remember at the uh, groundbreaking for, or the announcement of the uh, Langston Slater uh, announcement, um, Mr. Falciccia, who's the deputy mayor of planning and economic development, uh, stated that, you know, he's kind of new to the CLT uh, model, which was kind of disappointed, but it, hey, at least he's, he's aware now. And so we're, we're hoping that this is just, you know, a sign of things to come and um, the Douglas CLT can be expanded to other parts of the city. Uh, Ginger, if you want to get more yeah. in. No, I think I think that's uh, that's great. I mean, I think we, it, as you can see, um, a lot of a lot of what we we care about is, um, you know, of course, we care about the actual property and securing that because at at the end of the day, like that's you know, people need places to live, to um, have their small businesses, uh, but equally as important are the the programs that we might be able to offer, the resources, let me not say programs, the resources to be able to, to connect. Um, there's, there's so many organizations doing amazing work here in DC and across this area. And, and what we're, well, part of what we are doing is filling a gap because there, there is, was not a DC wide land trust um, that was really trying to get to scale and grow and try and um, to, to be there and have a, a, our value is really to have that scale, but also focus on not just the properties, but also the people. And I can't, I keep saying that over and over again, but because that's why else would we be doing this? And so one of the things that I'm, I'm super excited about that we were able to do is an actual cash transfer program at our first rental apartment building and that happened because of uh, partnerships, um, groups that we were, the 11th Street Bridge Park, Martha's Table, and other folks that were getting together a, a cash transfer program. And because we were in partnership with them, we were able to offer that and 48 families were able to get $5,000, um, $1,100 in cash for five months, food and groceries every week and, and dry goods during the pandemic last last summer when things were pretty dire for a lot of families. Um, I'm not saying we could replicate that all the time, um, but those are the kind of things um, where we wanna meet people where they are. And of course, you know, you can, you can read some of our pipeline. Um, we did join a development team that is vying for the Reeves Center um, and um, helping, helping to, to secure additional affordability there. Um, but, you know, we just, we, we welcome people to join and help to drive what else we're going to get involved with, raise money, um, and help us, quite frankly, help us deploy. We, we are oversubscribed even on the 2 million, but you never know what happens, right? So, um, we need to, we need to keep on generating more. And Koi, I'm, I'm, I think we got one more slide here. 
Oh, there we go. Yes, yeah, so this is uh, just so uh, the first Wednesday of the month, if you wanna learn more about the Douglas COT or about the model, uh, there are webinars uh, that you can join at 5.30. Uh, just visit that, this Bitly site. Um, and then if, you're, if you live in DC, you wanna support uh, the effort that I'm part of in Southwest to expand uh, the Douglas COT at this uh, fire truck repair station. Um, you can visit that bit.ly down there. There's more information about the CLT model, um, a link to the uh, a Google form to sign on in support of it as well. Um, and if you, you know, just want to get in touch, then that's an email address where you can get in touch uh, with us. Thank you. <clears throat> Peter, do you want to take questions from the QA now? Yes, let me ask a, a, a few, read a few from the from the Q and A, and I I, I I think what we're only seeking short answers here. Uh, um, can you define terms? What specific is a CLT? How are they established, and how are they implemented? To Ginger or to Koi? Koi, do you want to take that one? Okay, all right. So, Phew, I defer. Oh, I'm still a novice at this, but uh, I mean, Ginger, you've been through this whole process, so you, you can speak with all right, all right. on that. Um, look, I, I, the crux of CLT is community, big C, and Douglas takes that really seriously, but big C, community, land, trust. Um, and it is about uh, membership, owning land, or having a legal responsibility for covenants, because sometimes you can't own the land. Sometimes you can't separate out the ownership and instead you use another legal mechanism. You, you place a, a legal covenant. But at the end of the day, it is a way for the community members to secure affordability. Community land trusts are nonprofits um, and they, at the, they can be organized in different ways, but they tend to have that tripartite board structure and have members elect the board. And they provide what we call collective stewardship, that ongoing partnership with people who reside in um, or do business in the CLT units. Let me drill down on the how are they implemented part. And you can answer that abstractly or you could answer this in terms of uh, Douglas. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the, the question is, whatever the sort of legal structure, I think one of the things the questioner is asking about is, how does it get started? I mean, it sounds as if you have to have the land or some lab on the land to, um, to set the covenants that, that you use to, to influence. Yeah. Uh, so so I'd actually, those are two different, I, I would separate those two things. Um, I would say the organization itself gets started with people. Right. Uh, yeah, you could start it with, um, there's actually some places that were started with municipal, uh, that municipalities were driving it, or maybe a group of professionals were driving it. Um, we, did, we didn't go that route. I mean, the, the group, we had an amazing group of, of very driven community members. How you get the land, how you get started that way, um, we actually had another slide, um, and you know, come, come, come to our Wednesday sessions. We can, we can drill down into this even more, but I will tell you kind of paths to acquiring land include donations, purchasing at below market rate, um, going in, and this is something that the uh, Douglas did, approaching developers who have already gone through community process, already had community buy-in, but had a gap in some way. They might've had a financial gap, they might have had a programmatic app. And we said, can we help you? Like, is, would it make sense? Are we the right partner? Um, after, and, and, and on our side, we have to assess, are they the right partner? Um, do they meet the, the matrix uh, of decision-making? And we had capital to be able to, to provide to the deal. And one thing that is very, very important is, this is not about um, walking in and, and purchasing the land. We, we're receiving title to the land 
and holding as a community that trust and issuing the lease back. But what we're actually doing is coming in and saying, what's the gap that we can fill? Can we fill an affordability gap with funds that we have been able to acquire? And can we fill a, a what we call programmatic gap? And then, and then there's a number of other pathways as well. You know, we might, we might uh, like, like what's happening in Southwest, which is so exciting. A group of folks are, have identified a parcel that is owned by the government right now um, and would like to see it, see the uses uh, reflect a commitment to permanent affordability. And the best way that they, they uh, decided to do that was through uh, CLT. So let me try. Let me ask you a question to follow up on that. We have um, a, a community center library that's owned by the district, it's public land. Mm -hmm. How would, say, a CLT be able to advocate to either be the development team or come on the development team for a big project like that? And when you talk about scalability, I kind of think about that because it is a large parcel. Um, I don't know some of the sizes of um, the other CLTs across the district, but that one would be a fairly good size. But how, what kind of process do you guys use to actually kind of advocate to get that and be a part of that process? And how could a community or even ANCs like ours assist you in that advocacy? Yeah, I think um, I'll answer one part of that. And I think Koi's got a really great um, perspective on the other kind of the advocacy part of this. Um, I would say, first of all, when we talk about um, CLTs, there's locations for this for the for the properties, um, but but a single CLT. Now this is different in different locations. Douglas Community Land Trust um, spent a lot of time looking across the United States at different models and said, in order for us to be sustainable, we should be thinking about a bigger scale. Um, and one of the things, but but keeping in mind the desire to maintain very hyper-local control, right? So what does that look like? It could look like a, a chapter, like what is forming in Southwest. It could also just look like people who are very interested. We have limited equity housing co-ops. Some of them came over to us through, uh, um, uh, provided to us through one of the organizations that incubated Douglas Community Land Trust, City First Homes. I, served as executive director there for a little while um, as we were planning to bring those units on board. Um, but sometimes it's people who are organizing just at a singular development who say, we, we want this to be maintained as affordable, not just for us, but for people who come behind us. And they see that the CLT can help to serve that function. Um, being involved on larger scale projects like uh, us joining in on, as Koi mentioned, the Langston Slater project, that's not super huge, but it's, it's pretty large and complicated. There are five development partners there and we're part of the development team, but we're not a lead developer. We're not set up to be a developer. Um, we are set up to make sure that we, we're, we're savvy enough to understand the development, we hire real estate consultants and, and have folks um, weigh in on those aspects. And I've spent part of my career in that realm as well. Um, and it's similar, the, the role that we're playing, um, say at the Reeve Center or, or say at the uh, Community Center parcel, um, the Southwest site. It, it really has to do with I go back to the, it has to do with what, what, what's the gap? What's needed in the development? What are folks thinking about? And we're, we're dealing with one thing, uh, a, a little bit smaller opportunity um, right now where we're actually involved with a little bit of organizing. We'd like to do a lot more. We're pretty small. We're only three people. We only had the third person join a few months ago, um, but we're small in terms of staff but that's the beauty of having members because we really we want the members to drive what's happening. Peter? Um, let me ask a question as a AMC commissioner, a colleague of, uh, of 
what Lee says. Um, the major mechanism for subsidizing the land, um, uh, if I understand it correctly, it is that you are going to treat the land, you're holding it in common, and whether you hold a, 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 a some sort of restriction on the land or you actually own the land. Um, uh, it, it is the subsidy is through the land and how you uh, bill for the land, if you will. Um, but this city has a real need for a lot of affordable housing. Um, so uh, as you go up, <laughs> it gets more expensive. Um, and I guess I, the question to you is, that, is there a kind of natural limit to what uh, CLTs can do in terms of the size of the project that they can subsidize through their treatment of the underlying land. That is that is an excellent, I, I think that leads, that's an excellent way of getting at a critical aspect of this, which is our, while some people do describe it as purchasing the land and removing the cost of the land from the development, our approach is really about providing, if if needed, if if and of course subsidy is always needed in affordable projects, um, but it is about providing that subsidy to the project as a whole. It actually doesn't matter what the land is trading for. You can set it up any number of ways. I mean, there's legal boundaries here, but we did a project. Um, with a land value of much, much higher than what we actually traded the, the what we actually had on the deed, um, what we paid for the deed of note, right? Um, so I wanna make sure that folks get away from thinking that the subsidy is tied to the land. The land is the mechanism by which we can enforce covenants. Um, the land is a useful way of thinking about, um, of, of organizing around. I'm sorry, my, my, my dog has decided I've gone on long enough. So, but what, well, okay, let, let me try it. Um, um, and, uh, and by the way, I, I do know that there's, I apologize, um, there, I know there's a lot to get into, um, we're happy to continue the conversation and we do welcome people to be in, in dialogue with us. Let, let me read another question. Um, uh, 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 would Chevy Chase be a good target for, for CLTs given that the family sized home prices here are typically over a million dollars? Absolutely. It's, it's because of that, that it's a good place. Now, the, the trick, of course, is the acquisition. How do you structure the acquisition? Um, it's, it's a great deal of subsidy required. Um, but one of the things that I think uh, we are looking at some of, and, and others who are, have been in this business for quite a while are some policy incentives, incentives via policy and maybe some tax code incentives to help people to maybe sell at below market rates in exchange for something on the back end, right? So you can already sell at below market. And I'm not, I'm not a tax lawyer. Uh, I, I'm not even trying to play one on Zoom, but you can already sell and, and, and take that differential as a, as a donation, right? So on your, on your taxes, you can get financial benefit right now? Is there something to sweeten the pot? Is there, um, is there a way to streamline a, an exchange here in the district in order to make it even, uh, even easier or, or incent more to sell lower than the absolute highest that you could possibly do? We actually just got a donation from somebody who moved here and knew that he was a gentrifier, his terms, not mine, and said, I am donating 1% of the sale of my home because I know what my moving in here is going to do. I'd like to 
work with you to figure out how we can maybe get more people to think along those same lines. If 1% of, of uh, the transfer of properties could go into a pool to subsidize the acquisition somewhere, uh, that, that's yet another uh, possible way that we can build funding in order to acquire. What we don't wanna do is incent people to sell for, oh yeah, they're, they're over here raising funds. Um, we don't want to, we don't want to create additional issues for ourselves, but we, we absolutely would welcome your thinking about what other policy uh, levers could we, could we pull me, to make this better? Another question. Can you have a sealed designated historic uh, district? And I just say, there are some people in this community who are pushing for a historic district as a mechanism to control development here? I, I don't see any reason. I mean, we know of CLTs that operate in historic districts. Um, I don't see any reason why you, um, I think it can, it can create some special um, issues for homeowners who are low income that have to comply with certain um, historic regulations. We actually came up against that in one of our very first property uh, projects that we were looking at. It actually didn't end up going forward. But one of the things that we were going to, we were prepared to do is set funds aside in a maintenance reserve fund that these homeowners would be able to access later on. So we were going to capitalize a maintenance reserve fund upfront uh, let that funding grow over time so that they could access it when, you know, windows um, on the front needed to be replaced, for instance, and, and would cost more if it were, uh, cost more because they're in a historic district. Okay. Uh, do you see a CL, CLTs as a more effective alternative to uh, inclusionary zoning incentives? Do you see the CLT incentives is a more effective uh, alternative to inclusionary zoning. Well, I, I'm going to let Coy answer this one. The only thing I'm going to say is inclusionary zoning doesn't come with community. Like the CLT is about community control. IZ has, I'm not going to, I'm not going to bash IZ. Um, well, I will because uh, we've seen IZ is at 8% and that's like, not even close to what we need. Uh, the Metropolitan Washington Council of Government said that 75% of new housing needs to be aimed at those at low and moderate incomes and 8% is not it. IZ plus still is not it. Like, I get the idea behind it, but uh, in practice, we've seen thousands. Of, uh, yeah, I think we have, we've seen over a thousand units in Southwest and we still get this small sliver of uh, affordable units. And then there's also, what is IZ? So like, what is affordability? So we've had a lot of projects at 80% AMI, MFI. We've had some projects at over 100%. And I'm like, yo, this is not, this is not what IZ is supposed to be doing. Um, so I'm 100% saying CLTs are more effective than IZ. And, and, and I will just add that there are plenty of CLTs uh, there, this is a, that's a whole other, I, you got to do another webinar on this. That is another uh, webinar. <laughs> but, uh, but, but other CLTs um, actually serve as the stewards for their inclusionary zoning units um, for the municipality. And that actually seems to be a very worthwhile partnership um, because to Koi's point, um, what affordability level are they reaching? Yes. And who is serving, um, who is providing the oversight as to the resale compliance. Another question, I, I'm gonna slightly interpret it. How does or does uh, the CLT model work uh, with commercial development? One of the concerns of this is that we have neighborhood businesses that a lot of people are concerned will um, be erased if there's a very heavy development along our, our main street. 
Yeah, I mean, um, a very quick answer is that those same covenants that we use to talk about affordability levels, and typically you utilize median family income as your as your baseline, right? Mm -hmm. So for commercial, there are two main ways that I have seen this done. And one is a use, again, a use restriction. So you actually, um, and this is going to be different by municipality, depending on how they interpret um, federal law about uh, the um, not discriminating, not discriminating against certain tenants, right? So I, I'm not going to, I can't get into all of those details. Um, but there are ways to put use restrictions into a covenant. Um, and then the similarly, you can restrict the amount of rent that can be charged um, as a, as a complement to uh, the use restriction. So uh, there are a couple of places and I, I'm trying, we might have that portion of our website undergoing some changes, but we do have, we have some resources around, um, there's a resource section that's being built out on the Douglas CLT website and another website that is really good. And um, actually we can put this in the chat, groundedsolutionsnetwork.org, which is a national network of community land trust and shared equity type organizations. Um, but there are a number of those. Uh, there's one in Alaska um, that there's a, a that has that have really focused in on commercial, C, the commercial application of a CLT. Um, another one in um, New Mexico, and a couple in California that are doing both housing and commercial. And those are the ones that we we actually were looking at. Um, so we'll make sure that uh, we can. We'll, we'll make sure that um, we have those up on the website. And for anybody who's interested, uh, we can send around a little packet of reading material about CLTs and other CL, uh, specific, specific to commercial CLTs. There's another question in the chat. I'll read this one out. <clears throat> if a CLT could acquire net very low cost underdeveloped parcels like large parking lots adjacent to developed property properly zoned areas is that something that is optimal as a land lease fundamental element foundational element sorry absolutely yeah 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 um and specifically because um you get to start from scratch with the community on determining what they want to see and have the community do the um, and things have gotten a lot better here in DC in many respects around garnering community input. But we could also do a lot more. Um, and there is no replacement for having very local control, uh, very hyper local. Um, and be careful about that because we also we also see the negative impacts of that, but that's where having a third party organization like a like a land trust come in and be able to um, serve as a facilitator of community input for well, what what is going to happen on that site. Um, it, it's easy to think that the loudest voices and I know the ANC faces this a lot too. Um, the loudest voices uh, are those the ones that whose opinions just get inked. Do you want to do another question? I'm not sure I have one. But it's, uh, do you see one that uh, goes to the heart of these issues? There's a new one on chat, uh, Barbara Robinson. Yeah. yeah, I thought I just saw that. Property affected by the, the CLT. How is the tax assessment? So I would, um, there's a couple um, on, on both sides. So we see what we have been seeing in DC is um, there's been movement to a, a 
just the tax code for affordable properties, affordable housing properties, so that they could get a buy right abatement. Um, and so there's already on the books abatement for a low income housing tax credit properties. But we actually just last year ran into uh, there's a snag in that no ground lease. LIHTC, they're called the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Properties, could take advantage of that tax abatement. So the uh, Robert White's office um, actually wrote a uh, into the Budget Support Act some language around fixing that so that ground lease not only um, not only those that own both the land and the property could take advantage of it, but those are ground lease. And that affects not just, not just CLTs. I mean, other folks use leases um, as, as a means of development. There are also, uh, if the question is about how the assessments of other properties, like kind of like the, or is it just specific to the property itself? I don't know. We we could promote the 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 the, the questioner. I, I think the implication is is I think the implication is, and um, Barbara Robinson could uh, text uh, if I'm wrong. That uh, that it, it, it is is CLT property treated with some um, uh, tax benefit that is a, it basically is flows of uh, uh, that helps CLT. Not, not yet, <laughs> not yet, but with your help. <laughs> um, no, that, that is actually, uh, in, all, in all honesty, we, we would like, we have seen other jurisdictions create legislation that, um, that said that for, for CLT properties, they would receive a, a tax benefit, either an abatement or just a, a rescission. Uh, I wanna step away from asking questions that I'm reading from other people and ask one as a commissioner. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, I understand the question. I understand your emphasis on the, the, uh, this mechanism providing the community a voice and sort of start with community and then, uh, but I must say, we, uh, there are a lot of people in this community very worried about overdevelopment and the club, <laughs> we're looking for ways to control that. And the question remains, if for example, we wanted to protect some of the businesses, uh, the locally owned uh, and run businesses on Connecticut Avenue, um, how do you get, I mean, how do you, other than pure politics of working, basically doing community organizing and building community objection to overdevelopment. How does the CLT model help uh, 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 guide development if it doesn't have a grab on land, on parcels? Of yeah, I, I mean, I think I, you are right on target that uh, having something makes people listen to you more, right? <laughs> so um, that said, that's part of the you know, part of the uh, part of the equity equation is is understanding that power is about voice, and power is about enabling folks that have our have already been talking, have already been trying to move things around along or have already been trying to uh, see development move in a certain way. Um, the land trust provides an infrastructure for those voices to be channeled, right? To, and, and I don't, take that lightly. It's actually, it's a lot of work and it's, I, there are other community organizations across DC that have done fantastic work in that regard, in organizing. Um, I, I just don't default to the model where if I don't have, if I don't have the thing, um, then I, then my voice doesn't matter as much. But we're also not naive to think that, uh, 
that doesn't yield power. So we're kind of playing both ends of the candle, if you would, um, both on the organizing and trying to acquire and control property. And look, it's not just this generation, right? Because that very thing is what we're talking about. What happens for the next generations? If, if the community land trust can control that for the next time, um, the members themselves, uh, the board of directors for Douglas anyway, cannot decide to dispose of property. The, the members have to do that. I think, I know Connie has a question, but just to piggyback off of that discussion, to me, that's the power of the whole justice approach in this model is because, you know, we are, it is a, a model that looks at um, the community voice. And we know that in our current models that we see every day throughout the city and throughout the country, it is a model where the power is in what you have, whether that's money, land, all of that is at the surface and at the top. Um, and the community, I think, you know, just one of the beautiful things about the community land trust model, it kind of flips that on its head and it looks at it from a justice perspective and, you know, kind of says, you know, where should that, where should that power be shared and who's left out of that equation? So that's the beauty of that. And I think Peter, to get at kind of your question, to me, a lot of that lies in the leadership of the city. Um, and the city recognizing that there's an imbalance in that power structure. And for generations, we've had people left out of that equation, left out of housing, left out of equity for simply what? Because they don't have that power. So that's just my soapbox. Connie? Hi, um, I, I have a question that is um, it's similar to a Stewart's uh, question about um, a, a previous session, you know, we had a session with uh, the voices of dwellers here, residents who live in the apartment buildings and the condo buildings around here. And, um, and, and in that session on September 30th, a question was asked, like, could you afford to live anywhere else? And what would you like to have? And a lot of these residents who live in the apartment buildings, um, they, they could be a couple with a single child. And the second they have a second child, they've grown out of their space. And for them to find more space, it's very difficult here and they tend to move out. So they've been here for many years as, a, as an integral part of the community and then they have to leave. And so um, Stuart's question here, um, uh, he asks, uh, we heard from neighbors who live in apartments that short of a single family home with a basement and a yard, they want affordable two and three bedrooms, and three bedrooms is key, is, is that something CLTs can offer and promote? And so I wanted to ask you when you mentioned it earlier that you have 219 units in your portfolio, 141 are uh, limited equity housing co-ops, 10 are condos, three are single family homes, and 65 are rentals. Are these properties properties that already exist mostly, and then you and then you purchase it, meaning you per, you get the deed of with of the land underneath it, or are these a lot of properties that you built from scratch, kind of like what you're doing maybe at the Reef Center and other places in DC, and um, and were you to build it from scratch, what is the likelihood of being able to offer? Um, you know, a three bedroom. And then I have a follow up, uh, a question, uh, an additional one. Just got to get it in. Okay. Sam so, very quickly, um, the 219, they are, they, these are not new construction. They, ex they were ex existing. The three co ops, um, so all of them have, each of them have amazing stories. And I, I at least want to just say that, particularly the limited equity housing co ops, these are, these were done by, tenants exercising their TOPA rights. Um, the, the 65 unit Savannah apartments, the rental unit, um, NHT Communities is the developer on that one. They're the developer owner. Um, again, tenants exercising their TOPA rights. You need to tell and, you what people what TOPA rights are. Uh, I'm sorry, tenant opportunity to purchase. So tenants who are living in, in rental buildings have that when a building goes up for sale, DC has an amazing law enabling them to get the first crack of the app. But who has all those many millions of dollars? Yeah, we, we actually have an apartment building right here on Connecticut. And um, 
I'm going to get this wrong, probably Livingston, right, right across from Starbucks, the Brittany, they're going through Topa right now. Okay. And so um, that's happening here yeah. uh, in our district. So what you're saying is you are taking over mostly existing property. And we know that the, that the opportunity for lower income, um, I guess, people who live in D.C., that they're just not a lot of three bedroom apartments and they really do need need that to happen. And so how do we create that? I think that's still a question that that we um, don't have. It, a firm it, answer to it is about it, it is about subsidy it is about um it's about subsidy and i'm going to say something that's probably unpopular with developers um it's about you know we we can't go we can't have the old business as usual with the the developer fees being as high as they were um we've got to ask for more to go back to the property um as opposed to the way that it has been and that is a very difficult turn to take so i have two more questions um one is about uh you said that the clt like douglas will come in and you might look at parking lots like you know spaces like that you you also i see in your portfolio you have single family homes so it's possible that you that there are many blighted and perhaps vacant homes around the district. This is something that Chairman um, Mendelson has brought to brought to the table. So as our ANC, we've noted that there are many that we're kind of surprised about here. Uh, and so is this something that you're doing systematically, you know, across the district, kind of looking at blighted and vacant apartments, uh, uh, houses, and trying to see whether or not you can apply the CLT model you know, so that they, it doesn't get turned around, purchased by a developer, then sold for three times the amount. And then, as Koi told us at the very beginning, you know, culture changes and it's not the same city as the city of, of Washingtonians. Um, is that something that you're doing? Could you tell us a little bit, share a little bit about your plans? And then I have a third question, sorry. Uh, so uh, this will be <laughs> quick, because I'd, I'd like to be able to say, absolutely, we're doing that systematically. But the reality is we're not there yet. We, we have been, uh, as one of my board members always likes to say, we've been building while we're flying. Um, mm -hmm. So we, we absolutely want to be doing that systematically. We, we have a, um, we, we need to build that program out. It's actually, as, as I didn't label all or finish listing out all of the pathways to acquisition, but that is certainly one of them. Um, and right when we first started, we uh, assembled a list of properties with the help of the Urban Institute, um, specifically focused east of the river, right mm -hmm. around the bridge park. But um, mm -hmm. it's absolutely something that we we want to we want to be able to do it I, more. I think that's an op that's an opportunity for the district, uh, for council members, and for the district, you know, the the mayor's office, you know, for them to really think through this because there are a lot of properties that are sitting there unused, and we have people who need places yeah. to live. And, um, and if this can happen, that's great. So my third question is, this, is a question that was raised in the Q&A already. Um, and um, it says, Stuart, again, I am trying to understand how a resident owner of a CLT property who is prevented by covenant from selling at market rate is able to get enough money out of a sale to buy a market rate property and or build intergenerational wealth. Now, Koi said that there have been instances where, you know, a ten, um, um, an owner in a CLT can save enough money to then w move out and buy a market rate house. I mean, when I looked at this model a few weeks ago, that was the first thing I thought, which is that we know that um, if you take a black resident, you take a white resident, black families don't have the, they're like, I don't know, three times as less or some horrible multi multiple, you know, uh, of a white family being able to create and generate wealth. And it's from property. I mean, so this whole thing of redlining and everything for, you know, decades ago has affected families today. So, you know, in our small area plan of Chevy Chase, you know, it's really important to look in the future. You know, so I have said in public, I certainly want to do the best I can to make, um, our our neighborhood affordable right but how do we how do we do this and build wealth because we know that through property ownership we have built wealth people who've been here uh, me included i never could afford to come here now i came here before the real estate went crazy right so i got lucky right but how do we create luck for people um and it seems like the clt model you know as koi 
showed in the slide, it is much less. It's at a three times less rate. So it's like you, you purchase it and the value doesn't increase over seven years, 14 years, 21 years. That's great because you're not you're not extracting all the value yourself, right? You're, you're giving it to the next generation, but it's so, it is so limited still. So um, have you thought about that a little bit more? What is your thinking about that in, in, in allowing individuals to create more so that they can, they can build the kind of wealth that, that is needed? Oh, absolutely, Koi, you wanna, why don't you jump, jump yeah. in there? Yeah. Yeah, I, I wanna just add a little bit about so for me, in my perspective, is, is that we got to flip using housing as a commodity to generate wealth. Like, I think this is the CLT for me and my approach to this is that it's one piece of the puzzle. There's other things like universal basic income, guaranteed income, uh, universal health care. There's, there's bits and pieces that if we work on these different movements together, then people aren't wasting a whole bunch of money, you know, on all these other things. They're actually able to save money. Um, reparations for me is, is one thing that, you know, that, that needs to be a conversation as well. But we can't rely on housing as being this way to bridge this, these historical wrongs because we're then we're continuing it into the future. And we got to get, for me, we got to get housing out as a commodity. That's just, for me, that's, it's, it's unethical to keep on going that way. We have other fights, other struggles that we can do that can uh, pitch in and help with, it, with this effort. Go ahead, Ginger. Yeah, Thank and you, I, I was quickly trying to, um, I was quickly trying to pull up a, a document, but again, I'm going to, I'll make sure that we have it um, easily accessible on the website. Um, but that same model that Koi walked through earlier, and there's just, there's one number that sticks out in my head. We did a side by side. So what, what Koi was focused on and showing that was um, keeping it affordable. The other part of that is, all right, well, what's the return to the resident, right? So in our model, we also show what, what could be the equity build. So what's the equity build for somebody? Um, and, and in that first, that using the same, uh, in that same model, we showed an equity build of approximately 20, 21,000, um, something of that nature. Um, so that is- that would, be, that would be a great additional slide. If yeah. you could add that slide, and we're going to post up your presentation. We're going to post it on the ANC website. But having that slide is important because that is the question that does come up. Yeah. You know, and it's because we are seeing housing as an asset, whether or not we're thinking about, about it as a commodity, meaning easily tradable and so forth. Um, that's something that um, I think we all have to think about. But certainly right now, it's still a major asset for a lot of families and, um, and building that that how how CLTs build that equity piece yeah. is is important to show. So thank you so much. Yeah, I would just very quickly add that we um, if if we say very frequently, if a family can access can can acquire property can get into a home without that is not a non CLT home, they should do that. Go that route. And in fact, that's part of our home buyer education is to make sure people really, really understand what that means for them. What we're talking about is making spaces for people who otherwise cannot get in. So it's not a question of you're not gonna build, you know, oh, they're not building enough. They don't, like, how much are they really building? It's really comparing apples with, I don't know, uh, I don't know, mothballs or some, like, it's just, they're two totally different things. You're either gonna create opportunities for people to build some kind of equity but more importantly, be able to stay and live here and have a stable, uh, healthy environment. I think, Jinder, you that um, is a really good conclusion um, category because I think you nailed it. And I kind of look at it, too, from the perspective of the other alternatives. I mean, we know that our renters in D.C. and particularly Black renters and people of color spend a tremendous amount. I mean, they are so rent burdened and to move into the CLT model out of that renter model. I mean, my gosh, I mean, you know, so when you look at it kind of too from that way, whether that equity is building smaller, you know, we all have to start somewhere and this, this is a great start and it, it you know, gets them out of that rent burden category. So that's a really, um, excellent thing. 
So with that, you guys have given us an extra half hour. We appreciate it. This was a really, really great discussion. I cannot tell you guys how cool you see me on Twitter. So you know sometimes how I can get into these rants. <laughs> so um, I'm really grateful to have this discussion and to uh, bring you guys to Chevy Chase to talk about this with our community and our commission and just to share your um, thoughts and ideas, mm -hmm. the uh, racial justice model of um, community land trust, the equity model, it's just been terrific. With that, I will conclude, I will have one last round. Any last major questions from the commissioners or anyone out there? Okay. Thank you so much, guys. This will be um, posted on our website, so you'll be able to access it. And I have a copy of the presentation already. And Ginger, if you could send me a copy of that extra slide, we'll post that. And I think Stuart wanted a link to the 11th Street Bridge. I'll go back in the chat. Yeah, we'll post that as well. And somebody will send me this video. Yeah, um, Rand Randy will send you the video. I'm going to try to capture I'll all the names. Yeah, let's capture all the Q&As before yeah. you, you could end the recording, though. And okay. I could do that. Thank you so much, both of you, Coin.